welcome to eighth exam the emergency medicine exam uh, today we are going to discuss a case of acute onset breathlessness okay Sir, shall we start? yeah fine there is a 77 year old female who presented to our er with complaints of breathing difficulty and cough since past two days okay coming to our primary survey on my initial 10 second assessment the patient was conscious oriented and tachypneic coming to airway the airway was patent and the patient was speaking in one full sentence okay coming to breathing the respiratory rate was 25 okay. per minute and saturation of 88 percentage in room air okay since there is hypoxia we hmm. started uh, the patient on a face mark of about uh, five liter of o2 okay. can you just briefly tell me regarding the oxygen delivery devices what are the devices available for us uh, we can uh, from low level to high level mm. uh, oxygen supply we can start with uh, nasal prongs okay uh, nasal prongs uh, okay nasal prongs so what is the thing that you can give in nasal prongs maximum we can give up to 4, four liters. liters okay so 4 liters for your nasal prongs so that is the first thing that you need to remember what is the next thing that you can tell me uh, we can go with face masks sir okay we can do with the face, face mask. mask so what is the uh, face mask uh, what is the other name of face mask what is the other name? It is otherwise called as Hudson's mask. So it is otherwise called as Hudson's mask. So how much liter we can give? We can give from 4 liters to 10 liters. 10 liters. So that is the for your Hudson's mask. So Hudson's mask, face mask is otherwise called as uh, Hudson's mask. Next thing, what is the other option? You can go for NRBM. NRBM. So what is NRBM full form? NRBM. So what is the full form of NRBM? Non-rebreathing non mask and if you are giving more than 12 liters to 10 lit, uh, 15 liters, so, sorry, 10 to 12 to 15 liters, 15 liters, what is the target of FIO2 you can achieve? You can achieve an FIO2 from 80 to 100 percent. So that is the most important thing that you need to remember, 80 to 100 percent. So when you use an NRBM, when you give an oxygen of 12 liters to 15 liters, you can achieve a saturation of 80 to 100 percent. So, where are you don't want these things to happen? So, where you want to give a control oxygen therapy? In COPD patients, sir, we have to maintain an oxygen saturation of 88 to 92 percent. Okay. So, what is the reason behind that? So, this patient has come to you with an patient was conscious oriented in your assessment. Airway was patent. Patient was speaking in one full sentence. And he had a respiratory rate of 25 and SpO2 of 88 percentage of room air. So, if this patient is a COPD, you wanted to do anything, you wanted to supplement him on oxygen. No, if this is a COPD patient, we have... We doesn't want to supplement on oxygen. Otherwise, COPD, our target will be 88 to 92 percentage of SPO2 only. Why that? Because... No, in COPD patients, hmm. the carbon dioxide retained is the, uh, helpful for the dry, the respiratory okay. dry. So, normally what is happening in our uh, normal patients is that, that hypercapnia is the dry for us to breathe. So, that is for normal patients. For COPD patients, what will happen? This hypoxia is there dry for the stimulus for them to know that they need to breathe. So, COPD patients, we need to target only a saturation of 88 to 92 percentage only. So, that is the difference. Then coming to the next thing on auscultation, you heard bilateral V's. Okay. So, what was done for this V's? Uh, we have given, uh, started the patient on uh, neb, uh, salbutamol. Okay. Okay. Salbutamol nebulization. Sir, Can you tell minutes, me the dose of salbutamol? Uh, 20 minutes, 3 times apart we were given. Okay, Thank so 20 know. minutes, 3 times you have given salbutamol nebulization. You can use salbutamol or levo salbutamol. So what is the difference between salbutamol and levo? Levo salbutamol, L diolin levo salbutamol. It is levo salbutamol. What is the difference between normal salbutamol and levo salbutamol? So technically what they have come up with is that when we are using a levo isomer, there is decreased chance of tachycardia and tremors. So that is the only advantage of levo over your normal salbutamol which is available. So that is the levo salbutamol and the salbutamol difference that you have. Now, circulation. All peripheral pulses were palpable but mm. at this point of time we have put two large bore IV cannulas okay. in case if he wasn't we need to suffer. Okay. So, what do you mean exactly mean by a large bore IV cannula? Uh, 18 gauge. 18 gauge or anything less yeah, than 18, 18 gauge. gauge. You can have 16 gauge and you can have uh, uh, 14 gauge also. So, anything less than uh, 18 gauge you can call it as large bore IV axis. Okay. You can go to the next thing. Coming to BP was hmm. 120, 70 and heart rate of 110. Okay. So, basically we have a patient who has uh, 
come up with a history of 77 year old female who present to her ER with complaints of breathing difficulty and cough since last two days. Any history of fever she had? Uh, no sir. No, no history, history of fever. fever. Okay. So disability? Pulse GCS was 15 by 15 mm. and pupils were bilaterally equally reacting to light. Okay. Coming to uh, exposure, temperature was epibrile and GRBS was 167. Okay. On reassessment, the patient, we uh, put the patient in proper position mm -hmm. and saturation improved, improved to 96 percentage in 5 liter O2 with oxygen mask. 5 liter O2, okay. Coming to the adjuvants of a primary survey, mm. we have GOPOR and ABG mm. and, and ECG and chest X-ray was done, sir. Mm. ABG, the values of the pH is 7.35. So it is normal. normal. Okay. Then PCO2 PCO2 of 40, 46. that is again normal. Then saturation of 86, 86. which is on the lower side. And PO2 of 57, 57, it is again on the lower side. And bicarbonate, again, it is normal. So from this, what is your inference? Uh, the, the patient is going into a type 1 respiratory type failure. Type 1 respiratory failure. So type 1 respiratory okay. failure. So that is the inference from your ABG. So type 1 respiratory failure. Suppose if the PCO2 is increased and your pH also decreased. So what will be inference at that point of time? Uh, Suppose instead of 7.35, your pH is 7.1 and PCO2 is 70. Same uh, patient. This is respiratory acidosis. The patient so respiratory acidosis. So the patient would have been going for an Type 2, two respiratory, respiratory failure phase. instead of type 1. So that is the only difference that you have. Instead of uh, type 1, the patient is already going for a type 2 respiratory failure. Okay, fine. Then coming to what the was the ECG finding? Uh, sinus tachycardia. ECG finding was sinus tachycardia. So uh, what all possibilities can you can have in an ECG for a patient who is coming with an acute onset breathlessness with these? Uh -huh. Sinus tachycardia. What is the most common arrhythmia that you will see in patients with COPD? Uh, the most SV. common that what you need to remember is multifocal atrial, atrial tachycardia, tachycardia or otherwise we can call it as MAT. Multifocal atrial okay. tachycardia. What is the definition of MAT? Uh, so more than or two uh, P so waves. So P wave morphology. When you are looking, it is an irregular P tachycardia. P irregular tachycardia. P wave morphology is what you need to look in for. More than two different types of P wave in your ECG, you can call it as the patient is having it. Multifocal atrial tachycardia and was the what was the X-ray finding? X-ray finding showed a mild uh, left lower lobe consolidation. You have the X-ray finding? No. Okay, fine. So coming to the sample history. Uh, the sample so we'll we'll just review back the patient. We what all we have done? We'll just review back. Okay. So uh, we have a 77 year old female who presented to ED with complaints of breathing difficulty and cough. You went with your primary survey, the issue what we found was saturation was on the lower side, only 88% and respiratory rate was a little bit on the higher side. So low saturation and decreased respiratory rate, this is what you have got and the patient had bilateral V's. So you started with nebulization with duolin or you can call it a salbutamol. Duolin is actually, you have two things, ipratropium is also added, but you have started with salbutamol nebulization here. Then what you have done, you have gone and with the uh, disability, the disabilities was fine, there was no fever. The patient was efebrile and saturation improved to 96 percentage with 5 liter O2 with oxygen mask. Then ABG was showing a type 1 respiratory failure. It is type 1 actually because uh, we have, have uh, we want as the type 1 respiratory failure. Then what was done? Sample history. Sample history was taken. You can breathe uh, the sample history. The patient presented complaints of breathlessness and cough since the past two days. Okay. It was productive and in One thing, bone yes, cases of bronchial asthma and, and diabetes mellitus. That is very important information that we wanted. Okay. The cough was productive in nature with mm. yellowish color sputum. Okay. Uh, more, the cough was more towards the night. Okay. Uh, dyspnea progress over the past two hours and okay. MRC grade 4 was on arrival. Okay. Uh, no issue with any chest pain, palpitation, orthopnea or thyroxine of any disorder. Okay. Coming to allergies history, the patient has allergy to both cold and dust. Okay. Uh, drug history, the patient was on Foracot MDA, two pumps DD, sir. Foracot MDA, 400 or 200, that is another information. He was on 400 or 200. Usually, they will be two puff means they will be on 200 because 400 means two puff will be an overdose to the patient. So, 200 microgram. What is the content of Foracot? Uh, uh, it is, you have a combination of steroid as well as you have a combination of a long acting Agonist, beta 2 agonist. So, these are the things that you will have in Furacot. So, already this patient on Furacot MDA, 2 puff BD. 
okay then and also metformin 500 mg od so what is this information important metformin 500 mg od in this patient uh, what what is the thing that you need to remember you have to be very careful that this patient is already having a diabetes so her sugar was only 167 at this point of time but when you have an acute exacerbation you tend to give steroids so her diabetes status can get altered and metformin is another drug if there is usually it is not very common to cause lactic acidosis but just keep in mind if the patient develop any metabolic acidosis metformin you can keep in mind okay okay next that is the past history she is a known case of bronchial asthma on mdi she mm. has similar episodes in the past especially during winters so this time it is actually in december time it's always that we see because of lot of viral infection and due to the climatic changes so that is very common to have exacerbation during this winter time known case of dm on oha okay, okay. In the general examination, mm. no pala, ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or edema was also. Okay. Coming to systemic examination, respiratory system, the upper respiratory tract was normal, JVP not elevated. Mm -hmm. Lower respiratory tract, inspection, the trachea is normal, affect with the node visible. Mm -hmm. Movements are bilaterally equal. Uh, accessory muscles of respiration is present. Okay, fine. Okay. Mm. Coming to palpation, the trachea was central, apex beat was felt in the fifth intercostal space. Mm -hmm. Chest movements were bilateral but reduced. Chest expansion also slightly reduced bilaterally. Vocal function is normal. Uh, percussion wise also all, all resonant on percussion. Auscultation wise, air entry bilaterally equal. Bilateral wheeze was present. So. Okay. So, bilateral wheeze, you didn't get any crepitations yes. or any localized crepitation. We didn't find any finding suggestive of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, can you elaborate uh, the treatment? So, we have a patient who had come, a 77 year old female who had come to us with history of breathlessness and cough since past two days and she is a known case of bronchial asthma. So, probably we are dealing with an acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. So, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. So, what are the common triggers for the acute exacerbation? What are the common triggers? Can you name first common trigger for an acute exacerbation? Uh, so, it is an upper respiratory tract infection itself. Can so, be the most trigger. common will be viral infection. So, viral infections are very notorious to cause this thing. So, viral infection then Hyperventilation, as, no, as exacerbation, period. reasons uh, for exacerbation I am asking. One is viral infection, okay. next will be the climate change. climatic changes, so climate. So that is now, uh, it is very cold now, so the climate changes again. Then, uh, then what are the other triggers? Any allergies, any other allergies, suddenly any exposure to any allergens, any allergy, then what will be the next reason? What will be the other? Uh, any allergy, exposure, dust, dust viral virus. infections, most common and climate. And if the patient exercise. skipped exercise, exercise, anxiety, this patient has skipped any medications or else without knowingly somebody has prescribed her drugs that can precipitate this. So, which all drugs that you should be using carefully in patient with bronchial asthma? Aspirin. Aspirin, most importantly you have to remember is beta NSAIDs blockers. and beta blockers. beta blockers. NSAIDs and beta blockers. Beta blockers, we need to be very careful when we are using these drugs beta blockers and NSAIDs in a patient with bronchial asthma. Okay. So, the, these are the most important things that you need to remember. So, uh, what is the difference between a COPD and a bronchial asthma? Uh, sir, in the case of COPD, it is uh, bronchial asthma, it is the airway inflammation, sir. Mm. Uh, that's why it leads to a type 1 respiratory failure. Is it reversible or reversible? Reversible. Reversible. COPD is not a irreversible. irreversible. So, that is only one major difference that you can remember. COPD, it is irreversible and asthma, it is reversible. So, whatever inflammation that is happening to the airway, when you give a normal this thing, it will be reversible. So, uh, can we just uh, go through the algorithm, whatever we have seen. This is the, which one is this? Uh, so, the GINA 2022 guidelines. guidelines. Uh, so, this is basically used for the management of the patient with acute exacerbations. Can you just uh, go ahead and explain to this step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4? Uh, so, initially we have, we will divide the patients into intermittent, mild, mm -hmm. moderate and severe based on the symptoms. Uh. Okay. In intermittent cases, we have uh, the symptoms like uh, less than 2 per week uh, daytime symptoms or less than 2 per month nighttime symptoms. Okay. That is intermittent. Okay. Uh, coming to the mild, it is the symptoms should be 3 to 6 per week or more than 3 per month. Uh, and uh, FPV1 will be uh, more than 80 percentage and peak expiratory flow will be less than 30 percentage in mild cases. Mild cases, okay. In moderate and severe, it will be the FPV1 will be 60 to 80 percentage and less than 60. Okay. And the peak expiratory flow rate will be uh, um, 30 percentage. Sir, 30 okay. Percentage, sir. And uh, the symptoms will be continuous and daily symptoms. Sir. Okay. Daily and continuous symptoms. Uh, and we will classify as uh, intermittent, mild, mild, moderate and severe. severe. 
simple thing. And you can have a life threatening one also. The patient comes very bad on gas wing state, you can have life impending threatening. Respiratory impending failure. respiratory failure, yes. life threatening. Okay. So, uh, what are this uh, algorithm for? Sir, in intermittent cases mm. and mild cases, mm. we will start the patient on uh, inhalational corticosteroids plus formatrol, sir. Okay. Uh, according to the latest guidelines, it is said that uh, we have to use inter in intermittent and mild cases this inhalational corticosteroids plus formatrol as and only when it is needed, sir. As only needed. Yes. Coming to moderate uh, symptoms, it is present. We will give uh, low dose inhalation corticosteroids mm. plus formatrol, but it is on a daily basis. Sir. Okay. Coming to uh, severe cases, we will put the patient on medium dose inhaled corticosteroids and formatrol. Sir. Okay. So medium dose with formatrol, formatrol. is mandatory here. Yeah. So, so medium cases. dose and maintenance dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid with formatrol. Then the last step we will add on a uh, long acting. Uh, Agent, long acting agent, and also depends upon that other uh, agents can be other added. agents can be added. So basically, the therapy is between a uh, high dose in the uh, inhaled corticosteroid with formatrol is going to be the key. So whether it is high dose, medium dose, or low dose, depending upon the severity and any add-on adjunct agents, you need to decide on that. Suppose the patient has come to your ED. Okay. Suppose you, I am asking you to write down a prescription. Can you write down a prescription for this patient on that side? Uh, so, so starting with what all things this patient is a diabetic patient, oxygen, how much you need to target. I need to write down a full prescription for this patient here. Uh, so first when, when the patient comes to the ER, we have to differentiate between whether it is an uh, What we can do, I will select a new page for you. So I will add a page for you. You can write down in the center. No. So when the patient comes to the ER, the uh. first thing we have to identify or diagnose is that whether the patient is a non is an acute infective exacerbation of bronchial asthma yes. or the patient is going into an impending respiratory failure. Sir. Okay. Because the management uh, difference in both cases. In an uh, acute infective exacerbation of bronchial asthma, mm. the patient is breathlessness but the patient is able to make some uh, uh, effort and sound and uh, he is maintaining the airway at this point of okay. time. There will be tachycardia, um, might be more than 120, respiratory rate is more than 30 uh, and uh, the patient is conscious and oriented. Okay. But in the case of impending respiratory failure, sir, the patient is confused, there can be paradoxical breathing and most importantly, there can be bradycardia. Sir. Okay. So, bradycardia there, we don't have any time. Okay. So, we need to go straight so away for a rapid sequence intubation. intubation so, whatever will be the ideal drug for rapid sequence intubation in bronchial asthma, which will be the agent. Selection of agent, ketamine will be an ideal agent here. So, ketamine, it has got a bronchodilatory property. So, ketamine will be an ideal induction agent in case of an bronchial asthma exacerbation. Uh, and usually, it is the best agent that you can give is ketamine. Okay. So, can you write down for the infective exacerbation bronchial asthma for this patient? Yes, what do you discuss? So, first. So, initially, we will put the patient in the propped up position. Propped up position. So, that is the first thing. Propped up position. Then. Then Next. we will uh, go for O2, sir. Okay, we target dispute of? More than 90 to 95% has to be maintained. Maintained. So, this is a patient with bronchial asthma. We are not dealing with a patient with COPD. Okay. If COPD, our target changes, we need to maintain between 88 to 92. Okay. okay, so this is a bronchial asthma patient. Then, then we will go for nebulization with Duolim, sir. Nebulization with Duolim. Duolim three means? Three cycles, 20 minutes apart. Sir. Three cycles, 20, 20 minutes, minutes apart. apart. Okay, so that is the next thing. Then? Then we will go for IV hydrocortisone. Sir. IV hydrocortisone or medial prednisone or Dexona, whichever is available. Hydrocortisone, you need to give approximately 100 to 200 mg. IV stat, stat you need sir. to give. Then, if still the patient is not improving, we will go for injection magnesium. You sulfate. can write down the magnesium sulfate, magnesium injection, magnesium sulfate. 2 gram over 20 minutes. 2 gram over 20 minutes. So, that is the next prescription that you need to do. So, what you have done is you have managed the acute exacerbation and also you can put down NIV. Yes, so, NIV is again one of the options. So, uh, instead of if the patient is not able to maintain and respiratory rate is very high, you can always choose NIV here. So, NIV keep aside and rest you need to prop the position, oxygen, nebulization and IV hydrocortisone and injection magnesium sulfate. Any role for aminophilin and derophilin? Routinely, no. Now, these are because there is a high chance of arrhythmia and therapeutic index is very, very low. Unless and until you are getting a very, very refractory case, only you can think of starting an aminophilin infusion. So, you have taken care of the acute exacerbation and breathlessness you have taken care. Now, you have to treat the cause. 
why this patient developed so what is the other prescription that you want here so we can start the patient on antibiotic so what antibiotic you wanted to prescribe for this patient she is coming from a community she has not gone into any other hospital so which are the common agents that you need to cover in here uh, so basically we can start from a low dose antibiotic so what antibiotic we want to cover gram positive, positive. so that is the most important thing gram positive thing is what we need to cover plus maybe an atypical coverage so that is the coverage that we wanted. We wanted a gram positive and an atypical coverage. So which antibiotic will have this? Which a basic antibiotic you can start as? You can start both this coverage. The ideal agent will be what? You can write it down. Acetromycin. Okay. So you can just write down acetromycin. Acetromycin injection. Acetral. Ac. You can just write. Acetro. That should be enough. We can give 500 mg. 500 mg IV. 500 mg is the dose. And that is the IV stat. And one thing that you need to remember, whenever you are giving acetomycin, don't give it test dose. Because test dose, that preparation, skin preparation itself can cause inflammation and pain. Acetomycin generally don't have any history of any allergies. So, you can directly give acetomycin. That is one agent you can safely give. Suppose you don't have acetomycin. What are the other options? What are the other antibiotics that you can give? Suppose acetomycin is not available, other option can be toxicycline. Doxycycline is again a very good option or you can go for your penicillins, any penicillins, but they don't have sometimes the atypical coverage. So, penicillin will have very good gram positive, especially augmentin. So, you can think of adding augmentin, augmentin. Then, what do you have instead of augmentin? Also, there can have respiratory quinolones, levofloxacin, very good drug, but only problem with levoflox is that it can have anti-tuberculous effect also. So, if the patient is having a background TB, so that might get masked. So, that is another drug that you can try. So, maybe in OPD basis, if the patient is coming to your clinic and going on, you can select any of these drugs as the tablets also. These are all available as tablets. So, basically what you need to cover is a gram positive agent and most importantly, you need to add an antiviral agent, especially now this is the season for H1N1. So, you can add what is Ocelatamavir, Ocelatamavir, otherwise the brand is Fluvir, Ocelatamavir. So, that is the other agent that you can add. 75 mg is the dose, 75 mg BD. 75 mg BD, that is the dose for oscillatomer. So, this will be the basic antibiotic that is needed for a patient with uh, suspected uh, acute exacerbation initially when you are thinking of these things. So, what will you plan when this patient is getting and where you will admit this patient? That is my question. Whether to the ICU or to the ward. That again depends upon your mild, moderate, severe, depending upon the severity how the patient has presented. If the patient has come with severity and life-threatening asthma requiring NIV, they need to go to the ICU. Other group of patients, you can uh, even some very mild cases, maybe after nebulization and this thing, you can even discharge them. And very few group category, the next category, you need to keep them in hospital. So, at the time of discharge, what are the things that you need to tell them? At time of discharge, what are the major things that you need to cover? They need to avoid frequent exacerbation, allergic exposure, anything is there that you need to advise them. Then if possible, after the time of review, maybe after two weeks, you can think in terms of vaccination. So vaccination is very commonly, you can think of vaccinating them with common or common antivirus, common vaccines, which is for pneumococcal vaccine, you can give also for H1N1 vaccination. So H1N1 vaccination, every year they need to take and maybe pneumococcal, depending upon the brand, they will have a coverage for two years. So vaccination is one thing that can prevent them with frequent at a hospital admission. So, if the patient is having recurrent admission, definitely you suggest them with vaccination. So, not at the time of infection, maybe after two weeks they will come for your review, at that time you can think and you should be discharging them with a steroid depending upon and steroid versus Frometrol inhaler depending upon the severity, the type in they came in with and maybe a short course of oral steroid. If you are giving it only more than two weeks, then only you need tapering dose. Otherwise, if it is less than two weeks, no need of tapering is needed for steroid. So, if you are giving Weisslon tablet for maybe like 1 milligram per kg body weight for the first 5 days, you can just stop it. So, if it, you are giving it more than 2 weeks, then definitely you need a tapering dose. So, that is the most important information and avoiding the triggers. That is the most important instructions that you need to give to the patients. Okay. Do you have anything else to add on? Okay, fine.